Hello and welcome to this lecture, which is an introduction to political geography. My name is Dr. Gerard Toll. I'm a faculty member in the School of Public International Affairs at Virginia Tech. And this is the introductory lecture to my course, Topics in Political Geography, which is being offered in the spring of 2017 at Virginia Tech's campus um, in Old Town. And actually it's offered to Virginia Tech students writ large because it's an online class. Now, let me just say at the outset, these video lectures are designed to help students in the class uh, work their way through the assigned readings. They're not a substitute for the readings, uh, they're a supplement to the readings. They will weave them together and hopefully uh, give you a sense as to why I chose them, uh, what things are important in these readings, and uh, give you a sense of the larger themes. Now, this is an introductory lecture, uh, and I expect that a number of you are not familiar with political geography or know what political geography is. So what I'm going to do is give you um, a set of definitions of political geography. Um, the book, Making Political Geography, by uh, John Agnew and Luca uh, Muscara, uh, the second edition of it, has a nice section where it discusses uh, what is political geography. It's on page 18. And they write, um, despite the history of contending perspectives, uh, there is a degree of co coherence to the term political geography that has persisted down the years and from place to place. And that coherence, they argue, is three dimensions to it. One is the persistent focus on a common set of concepts, particularly boundary, territory, state, nation, sphere of influence, and place. Even as these concepts have been endowed with changing meanings and applied in different ways uh, down the years. The second dimension uh, is on a theoretical focus which is, seeks to discover the ways in which geography uh, mediates between people on the one hand and political organizations and the other on the other hand. There is a persisting tendency to insist that politics cannot be adequately understood without understanding the geographical contexts in which it takes place, from global geopolitics at one end of the scale to local uh, geopolitics on the other hand. And finally, there is a third uh, definition, which is that it is a particular academic subfield. Uh, in this understanding, political geographers constitute a sort of intellectual tribe sharing certain norms of academic practice, how research is done, how articles are written, uh, that differ from those in adjacent areas such as international relations, cultural geography and economic geography. Now, those are useful definitions and uh, I wouldn't read them. Uh, otherwise, if I didn't think they were, but they're also um, somewhat inadequate in that um, I want you to kind of in this class and my understanding of political geography in this class is going to be less uh, the gesture that um, uh, we simply need to look at the geographic context of politics because I think political geography is much more than that. I also think it's not about making political geographers as a disciplinary category, although I do think that the subdiscipline has a lot to offer. Uh, but it's a, I, I want to get across to you that it's a way of thinking um, that has really powerful um, insights. And my working definition of it is a political geography, the study of the spatialities of power complexes. I know that term spatialities may be confusing to you, but it's the sort of the qualities of a space uh, and power complexes. I'm using that deliberately rather than saying the state, because I think political geography looks at much more than the state. And it, it, political geography, I want to, to argue, sort of insists on, on three different things. And, and John Agnew, who was my academic supervisor, uh, is a really a major figure in the field. And he has uh, pioneered the insistence on these particular, um, uh, these emphases. First of all, that it historicizes and spatializes the system of territorial states. Uh, in other words, there is an insistence that 
what we today understand as geography and understand as those core concepts, territory and the like, come from somewhere and that the meaning of these changes uh, so that we should not take them for granted. Uh, and we should begin to question the, the world political map. Se- secondly, it insists that we need to think beyond the state. We need to get beyond state centrism, which is an affliction that occurs amongst some within international relations and political science. We need to avoid, as Agnew puts it in one of his uh, important articles, the territorial trap, which means the state, the trap of thinking uh, in the kind of either or terms of, of the state system. And thirdly, political geography is really about exposing the messiness of entwined, overlapping, cross-cutting and contested spatialities of power complexes. The world is very, very complex and states are only one part of it and states in many instances do not work well and state systems that seek to control borders and and the like, they're scrambling. Sovereignty doesn't really quite work as it's advertised, as it's it's supposed to. And so we need to kind of appreciate that and and understand the a world in a thick way rather than falling back on rather thin understandings of the world. So those are uh, three ways in which uh, political geography is going to help us think um, as social scientists writ large. So what are some of the questions political geographers asks, uh, ask? So let me um, identify, I think I've identified four or five here. First of all, uh, that question about the spatialities of power complexes. We need to grasp there are different types of power complexes. And even when we say the state, we may be homogenizing states that are very different uh, and have different forms of sovereignty and, and the like. And so we need to insist on the heterogeneity. But just think for a minute in terms of a broader historical canvas. There are dynasties, there are empires, there are multiple state agencies, some of which operate across borders overseas. Uh, You know, the CIA, for example, uh, as opposed to the FBI, uh, it's focused on foreign intelligence issues. We have um, currencies which go across borders. Um, So one cannot talk about simply uh, a state being one thing. It's a complex of agencies. And then we have transnational uh, non-state networks. They may be advocacy networks. They may be transnational corporations that are grounded in certain places, but they have footprints in multiple locations and they may have staff that are uh, from very different nations. And then we have the uh, illegal um, um, cartels, uh, the uh, criminal gangs and so on and so forth that operate on a transnational basis because they're moving product across uh, borderlines. They themselves are power complexes and they create particular geographies. So what you get are different topologies of power uh, operating here. And I'm using the language of a uh, a geographer by the name of John Allen. Um, and so we need to kind of begin to think about uh, the spatial footprint uh, that is created by these different power complexes and how the spaces themselves are part of the operation of power. And um, now we also need to think about how they, they're lured upon each other, they coexist, they entwine, they clash. Um, and so, therefore, the what a political geographer examines is much more than simply states bumping into each other uh, and um, the, the inside or outside of a state. Uh, we need to think beyond the Westphalian system, the either or neatness of the world political map, because the world in its actuality is much more complex than is uh, than is advertised by uh, by the pl- just looking at an atlas of uh, the countries of the world. Now Agnew, in his essay um, that I have assigned here, uh, reviews all uh, different understandings of um, 
these spatialities of power and uh, uh, it draws upon some French geographers to outline an ensemble of worlds, a field of forces, hierarchical networks uh, and world societies. This very different topologies of power which can and do coexist. So his essay is this particular essay, Managing Political Power. Uh, but he has written so many different essays uh, on this particular theme. Uh, this is just a sort of a brief introduction to his work. Um, now, uh, a second theme, our histories of territory. Um, now, there is a traditional uh, form of political geography which uh, seeks to describe how states acquire their current territorial frontiers, how they were assembled from different parts and different pieces. Uh, so the work of someone like Norman Pounds, for example. Um, uh, he wrote two essays in the 1950s. This is one from 1951, The Origin of the Idea of the Natural Frontiers in France. And he's arguing against the idea that the, uh, France has frontiers which are defined by physical geography, by, um, by rivers and, uh, and the like. Uh, and um, he's arguing about, uh, he's providing a history really of the ways in which states are often agglomerations of very different types of territories. And those territories are put together uh, as a result of uh, geopolitical uh, machinations of various types. And so there's not, nothing natural about the territory of the state. It's something which is created and uh, we have to accept it can be undone. States can fail. States, some states in the past die. Um, so that's the first understanding. It's a rather traditional one. The second one is um, uh, an attempt by kind of modern political geographers to look at the ways in which the concept of the territory is not a transhistorical one. It's not something that necessarily existed in ancient Greece uh, and uh, in the medieval era. It is something that emerged as a field of intervention, as a particular goal and as a a sort of technological field or as a field created by certain technological forms, by statistics, by maps, uh, by uh, administrators um, at a certain time. And it emerged with other uh, problematics too. Uh, and so here I am thinking in particular of the excellent work of uh, the political geographer Stuart Eldon, who has written a whole book on the birth of territory. Um, and the way uh, drawing heavily on the, the writings of Michel Foucault, but also going beyond them and sort of um, deepening some of the, the arguments that Foucault was making about the development of uh, the modern state around the state defining the population as a particular object. So biopolitics, what Foucault defines as biopolitics, is also a moment, it's a moment where the population as an object uh, is defined, and then also the individual, because there's two sides to it. There's a population writ large, and then there's the individual as a subject of disciplining um, uh, strategies and institutions. But at that same time, you also have the development of territory. A modern understanding of territory is something which is to a sort of a garden that has to be tended to and has to be cultivated uh, and guarded by the state. Um, so that's to distinguished from uh, the idea of land and of terrain. Uh, and the essay that I had assigned for you on this is his essay, Land, Terrain, Territory, in which he discusses this. There's, a, uh, of course, his book uh, goes into greater detail. There's a series of other essays uh, by Stuart which uh, elaborate this notion. So that's a second theme and an important theme, the emergence of a modern understanding of territory. And remember that it's not something that's born fully formed 
and therefore stays the same from the mid 18th century onwards. No, it's it's a problematic that emerges, which is dependent upon certain technologies and uh, other objects like population, and it's constantly changing, and it's something that's n- it's a constant challenge to the state uh, to control it, to discipline it, to uh, to make it. Um, an object which is controlled by the state. So a third set of um, concerns are territorial discourses. And this um, is more contemporary, uh, 20th century, uh, 19th and 20th century. Uh, And here I want to signal the emergence of interstate norms around state territory, that uh, uh, each state has a territory and it is sovereign within that. Um, And then in particular, the emergence of the territorial integrity norm, which is something that uh, this is the phraseology of of political scientists. But I think it is useful for us to, to think true. So uh, in this particular instance, I'm thinking of Mark Zacher's uh, very useful essay, The Territorial Integrity Norm, and its particular emergence. Uh, But I also want to uh, talk about uh, Alex Murphy's work too, Historical Justifications for Territorial Claims, because it covers, this particular essay covers uh, some of the same ground. Uh, and what they're looking at in this instance is the um, emergence of a, a particular understandings of law uh, and how those understandings of law then become the basis for states to make claims to certain territories. Uh, and those understandings uh, of law also are... Um, Kind of understand, kind of prevailing understandings as to what is and is not acceptable. Um, so going to war and taking territory as a spoil of war becomes unacceptable uh, in the twentieth century. Although, as we saw in the, uh, after World War II, uh, that is precisely what the Soviet Union did. Uh, but nevertheless, it is something that uh, uh, was a norm which was challenged. Uh, and of course, this is sim- still a- in contestation today. So these are some points from Zacher's essay on the in territorial integrity norm. Uh, one thing I want to draw your attention to, we'll come back to it again uh, in the course, is the principle of uti posseditis. Uh, as you possess, which is a particular principle in international law, is that a, if a particular uh, entity is decolonized, um, the borders of the colony will remain as the defining borders of the community. And similarly, if a federal state begins to collapse, the borders of the constituent republics of that federal state become the new international borders. Now, that's that's a particular principle which is applied, and it is one that is quite problematic uh, following it. Uh, and as we'll see, it was contested by uh, a number of states uh, and um, movements that sought to change borders after the collapse of uh, of, uh, of Yugoslavia and of the Soviet Union. Um, so we're dealing with the realm of international law and uh, of norms here. Um, now, just to go back to this particular third point, um, so what discourses do states use to justify their territorial claims? And uh, I have assigned an essay by Alec Murphy on regimes of territorial legitimation. Uh, and his particular um, uh, uh, essay on that and his adaptation of Dura's notions to try to uh, elaborate this idea of regimes of territorial legitimation. Uh, And so that's a a way in which you can begin to to visualize that. There are other uh, themes here, theorizing territorial discourses, the particular uh, prevailing discourses on territory, population and security, uh, geopolitical narratives and frames about natural frontiers, uh, original ownership, spheres of influence, territorial justice, uh, protection imperatives, and so on and so forth. And we'll be uh, looking at those when we look at uh, the case of uh, Russia and Ukraine. 
Okay, the fourth um, question that a, and problematic that is addressed by a contemporary political geography deals with the contemporary geopolitical condition. And uh, here we're looking at the ways in which certain prevailing technologies of territorial assertion and, and grip, and I like this term grip, the degree to which the state has a grip over its territory. Um, how those are uh, changing and how does technological change, the invention of the internet, of uh, social media, of mobile phones, uh, and drones, and, and so on and so forth, intercontinental ballistic missiles, how does that uh, impact uh, what the state can do and what it can't do, or what it, uh, how the state has been sort of, uh, an end run has been uh, uh, affected against the state and its particular efforts to control its borders. What does transnational capitalist networks who are in part encouraged by the state, so we have NAFTA and the encouragement of uh, uh, free trade agreements by the state, yet uh, those clash with the imperative of the state to try to secure its borders. Uh, and so you have these tremendous contradictions and uh, challenges for the state to control territory, population and security, particularly in, era, uh, in the era of uh, in, uh, increasing terrorism, um, or at least the, the spectacle of increasing terrorism, even if the actual numbers uh, may not necessarily justify that. Um, so what are the contemporary practices that characterize contemporary, and uh, I hear the biopolitical and the geopolitical need to be thought together, uh, security struggles. Uh, and so in this course, we're going to look at power projections, we're going to look at the global war on terror, and we're going to look at border controls and uh, the desire for walls, the uh, desire for extreme vetting of certain uh, population groups, and the desire for bans. Let me give you some uh, sense of the ways in which uh, this works itself out. I, I've assigned uh, Stuart Eldon's book on um, securing the volume, his, his uh, essay rather, on securing the volume on the case of uh, Israel-Palestine and the ways in which uh, the Israeli state has sought to control the subterranean uh, area uh, where it believes, uh, where not it believes, where in actuality it, it is uh, um, dealing with uh, infiltration by Hamas and and uh, other uh, groups that are seeking to uh, uh, wage a struggle against uh, against the occupation of uh, the territory by the Israeli state. So uh, his uh, essay on vertical geopolitics is, is a kind of way in which you can look at a, a particular territorial struggle and some of the dimensions of it and it'll give you some sense of the ways in which political geographers are thinking in kind of creative ways about the challenges that uh, face us in the contemporary period. So those are four different uh, themes or questions which characterize contemporary political geography and we're going to be examining all of those in, different, uh, in the different modules in this course. Okay, thank you.